Hi. Today I'm going to read to you from The Web of Humanity, a novel by Maria Turchin. Chapter One History is just the stories of our ancestors, our families and us. Some people live their entire lives without knowing where they came from or what they believe in. But that's no longer me, thought Anna Venu, not after last year. Anna's grey eyes battled the sun as she looked out onto the Caramel Desert stretches of Phoenix, Arizona, from Sky Harbor International Airport. Her cell phone vibrated and pulled her out of her reverie. Her flight to the Dominican Republic had been delayed. Maybe it was the sweet smell of espresso from Cartel Coffee Lab, or maybe it was the distinct German seductively whispered between two travelling lovers. Still, whatever it was, something made Anna yearn to revisit her grandfather's memoir. The Memoir of Navy Lieutenant John Venu It was the end of the 19th century in New York. Like the stories of many Americans, my parents were immigrants, Sicilians hoping to escape poverty and life under Mafia rule. However, fate intervened and weaved unwanted irony into their expectations, turning their American dream into just another impoverished neighbourhood centred around Elizabeth Street in Manhattan, a district now affectionately dubbed Little Italy. During my parents' era, there were no quaint souvenir shops and gelato cafes, just slums, survival, and, yet again, the ruthless control of the Italian mafia. On the corner of Elizabeth and Hester Street, a tiny pastry shop emerged from my parents' endless work and perseverance. Our Venucci family secret cannoli recipe earned the shop its reputation. The innocent dessert became the particular favourite of a not-so-innocent man, Joe Masseria, better known as Joe the Boss, head of one of the largest New York gangs. My father was expected to pay him respect each morning with the delivery of ten fresh cannolis. In 1901, my older brother, Lorenzo, was born, which all of Elizabeth Street celebrated. He was a newborn in America, destined for greatness. Each penny was saved. He was going to be a doctor. He was going to make something of himself. He was going to take every scrap the American dream claimed to offer. My parents were to watch it all unfold, justification for coming here and for their continued suffering and hard work. And maybe they would have been if the Masseria gang did not exist or if Lorenzo did not have a temper easily seduced by power but it did, and he was. By the age of 17, he was already a street soldier of the Masseria gang, the cancer that metastasized through our, throughout our neighbourhood, preying on the lives of young men. Street freedom, easy money and easier girls trumped working at the bakery with immigrant foreign-speaking parents. And so he looked past the tears of my mother and the painful silence of my father. He simply ignored them. By the time I came into this world in 1922, Lorenzo was out of the house completely. The first shots of the famous 1930s Castellamares Castella War were fired around my eighth birthday. The bloodshed between the Maseria and the Maranzano gangs skillfully orchestrated by Charles Lucky Luciano, spread like wildfire throughout New York City. My brother was one of its first victims, and so, too, was our American dream. Devastated, my parents turned their focus to me to make sure I would not follow in my brother's footsteps. They did not have to try hard. I hated the Mafia as much as they did. I was not given the freedom Lorenzo had, so instead I read about it. Books about travelling and seafaring adventures filled my lungs 
with the aspiration and hope that I too would see distant lands. My copies of Captain Blood and Moby Dick were worn from use. I imagined myself pulling lines on a ship while kneading dough at the bakery. Every moment I could get to the docks, I was there. The stronger the wind, the heavier the rain, the more vividly I could see myself at the mast of a ship, a real seaman. When World War II began in 1939, I was nearly 18 and ready to enrol in the Navy, but was rejected, to my parents' relief. A childhood fracture had caused my right leg to be slightly shorter than my left. It was hardly noticeable, but unacceptable to Navy physicians. I felt cheated, my dream taken from me by something I had no control over, but I persisted. There just had to be another way, and I found it when I applied to the U.S. Maritime Training Station in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. I started my training as an apprentice seaman and graduated as a merchant marine in the rank of ordinary seaman. The Connecticut, a steam merchant ship, was the first realisation of my long-awaited vision. The ship sailed between South America and New York, importing coffee, sugar and exporting cars and heavy machinery for South American factories. This first trip was more thrilling than I had ever dreamed. Tropical flora, exotic ports, humid, dense air with every particle carrying the deep scent of coffee and cacao beans. Nothing like the street life of my New York City childhood. Intoxicated with joy, I looked to the future with the certainty and conviction that I was following my destiny. It was on the Connecticut that I met James, my best friend. On my first day on the docks, I walked alongside the ship, looking for the captain to introduce myself. The Connecticut looked like a massive sea monster groaning with delight as the port crane's ar giant arms fed it different pieces of heavy machinery. Crate after crate disappeared one after another into the beast. Obediently, provisions stood along the deck, waiting for their turn to be swallowed up into the ship's steel belly. In front of me, a group of sailors and port workers were gathered in silence, hanging on someone's every word. Straightening my uniform, I made my way swiftly in their direction, hoping to catch the last of whatever instruction was being given to the crew. I joined the semicircle just as a roar of laughter erupted. To my astonishment, the centre of attention was nothing more than a young sailor, only a couple of years older than myself. The look on my face must have expressed such surprise that it caught his attention. He locked his sharp eyes onto mine, ceasing his laughter abruptly. So, who are you anyway? he asked me. Caught off guard, I stared at him wide-eyed. Oh, my lads, I think the lady needs an introduction. He continued to taunt me. Everyone's attention was focused on me, watching as redness flashed across my face. Oh, no, we've got ourselves another shy one. The sailor snickered, fanning himself in a bashful, exaggerated motion. The crowd once again erupted in laughter while I attempted to look like I was in on the joke. To my relief, with their last laughs, the crowd dispersed. Still having no instruction, I was about to pick a direction to self-assuredly walk to when the sailor grabbed my shoulder. Don't be upset, lad. We were just having a bit of fun. I'm James, he said to me. James began to tell me a story with his arm draped around my shoulder as if we had been buddies for years. Two days ago, it was Mikey's birthday. And now what you got to know about Mikey is the kid runs his mouth about messing with Danes all the time, thinks he's Clark Gable. So I figure, OK, I'll take him to the cat house, see how suave he really is. So we're togged to the bricks, looking real sharp, except Mikey's trousers are too big, but it's the best pair he's got from his old man. James stretches his hands to show the width of Mikey compared to the trousers. We get When we get inside the joint, Mikey starts looking like a mess of nerves. James imitated Mikey, trying to keep his cool. We're facing the room of girls now. 
they're all winking, you know, pretending like they're crazy about us. And I'm chatting up this one broad. I look to my right and Mikey is frozen staring at a this at a blonde who's stroking his chest. All the hairs on this kid shot straight up like a damned cat. The girl glances at me because the kid looks stupefied. I mean, not moving stupefied, as if he's just seen a ghost. I shrug my shoulders and say that it's nerves. So the dame gets this sly look on her face. She says she knows just how to change that. Suddenly, she's shoving Mikey's head between her breasts and he starts shaking uncontrollably. We start cheering him on, not expecting that all that shaking would wriggle his pants straight to the floor. Poor Mikey feels it and starts waving his arms around, but the broad doesn't notice and thinks we're all laughing along with Mikey's good time. The idiot steps back and trips over his own pants and falls backwards. So there's Mikey on his ass, beaming a, like a red Christmas light in front of a room of laughing dames. James is laughing so hard he can barely finish the next sentence. And then, he says, trying to keep his words straight, we see his underpants wet right where it counts, the poor devil. James's laughter turns into tears, making me dissolve into hysterics right alongside him. And then you walk up with that petrified look, just like Mikey. Oh, I'm sorry, lad, but I couldn't help myself. James composes himself and wipes his face. He then asks me where I'm from and what crew I will be a part of. He gets a bit more serious and says, Kid, listen, we're your family now. So don't think for a second that you can't rely on any of us like you would on your own brother. Shaking his hand, I smirked at the irony in his sentence. I wouldn't have trusted my brother with anything. James was about five foot eight, and even though I towered over him at six foot one, I still felt like I was the one looking up at him. His jawline was strong, and the features on his face were prominent all at once, giving him the appearance of somehow being bigger than he was and more mature than he was. Knowing James meant knowing an incredible storyteller with a sense of humour so great it heightened your own. With a strong willingness to help and a sense of camaraderie and the Irish ability to drink himself sober, James was loved by every crew member from the captain to the wiper. The only treasured possession James carried was a stone cross that hung from a thick leather string between his collarbones. A well-known priest gifted it to him when he was just a boy, days before his family emigrated to America. Even though his Irish roots should have rendered him my enemy, they brought me closer than my Italian blood had to my own brother. Being a few years older than me, but already ranking as able seaman, James took on the responsibility my older brother never did. We became inseparable. On December 7th, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. A day which will live in infamy had turned our lives upside down. Four days later, Germany declared war on the United States and overnight sailing became a life-threatening ordeal. German submarines arranged themselves into wolf packs, ravaging our transatlantic communication lines. Those of us who sailed between South America and the United States didn't experience U-boat encounters. Yet hearing the stories of other seamen who'd survived the brutal attacks in the Atlantic and were miraculously rescued by merchant or naval ships kept our eyes constantly scanning the seas. The situation changed dramatically by 1942. U-boats increased the range of their operations and now started to hunt us along the Atlantic coast between the Caribbean islands, leading to more and more sunken merchant ships. In response, the US Navy began forming convoys of merchant ships, which they guarded with destroyers. The problem was there were never enough destroyers to cover all the transatlantic and South American routes. Many ships had to risk sailing alone since the Eastern industrial centres desperately needed bauxite or from Trinidad for steel production and fuel from the Gulf. By 1943, two things had changed. The US Navy learned how to deal with U-boats, turning the tide for the Battle of the Atlantic, 
in favour of the Allies, and both James and I started sailing on the turbine tanker, the SO Gettysburg. The ship belonged to the Standard Oil Co. of New Jersey and transported crude oil from the Gulf to the Upper East Coast. The Gettysburg changed my life, and I always kept a photograph of her on my desk.